Qu'est-ce que tu fais comme mon père Qu'est-ce que tu es capable de faire pour ton enfant In the words of Detective John Smith, revenge may not bring back our loved ones, but it can provide a sense of justice and closure. Revenge is a powerful and controversial concept that has captivated the human imagination for centuries. In this video, we delve into the shocking stories of 10 parents who took revenge on their children's killers. Driven by grief and a desire for justice, these parents went to extraordinary lengths to ensure that those responsible for their children's deaths faced the consequences. From tracking down serial killers to confronting notorious gangsters, these parents became the ultimate avengers. The Rodriguez. In a world plagued by violence and corruption, one mother's unwavering determination led her on a path of justice and revenge. This is the incredible story of Miriam Rodriguez, a woman who dedicated her life to finding her daughter's killers. It all began on a fateful day in January 2014, when Karen Rodriguez, a young woman with her whole life ahead of her, was abducted by the notorious Zetas drug cartel. Karen's family, desperate to save her, followed the kidnappers' demands and even met with a cartel member who promised to help find her for a price, but they were deceived. Karen's remains were discovered at an abandoned ranch, leaving her family devastated and seeking justice. Miriam Rodriguez, a grieving mother turned activist, took matters into her own hands. She transformed herself, changing her appearance and adopting various disguises to collect names and addresses of those responsible for her daughter's death. In a daring act of bravery, Miriam even captured a cartel member while he was selling roses on the street. With a gun to his throat, she demanded answers and made it clear that she would stop at nothing to bring her daughter's killers to justice. Her story gained attention and admiration from her community. She set up a group of families whose loved ones had gone missing, providing support and hope in the face of tragedy. Together, they fought for justice and demanded answers from the authorities. One by one, Miriam hunted down the members of the cartel who had taken her daughter's life. With each successful capture, she ensured that they faced the consequences of their actions. Miriam's methods were unorthodox, but they were driven by a mother's love and a burning desire for justice. However, Miriam's vengeful actions came with unfortunate consequences. As she continued her pursuit, the cartel retaliated, targeting Miriam and her family. They became victims of threats, intimidation, and violence. Miriam's relentless pursuit of justice had put her own life and the lives of her loved ones in grave danger. Despite the risks and the personal toll it took on her, Miriam remained resolute. She believed that her actions were necessary to honor her daughter's memory and to ensure that no other parent would suffer the same fate. She was eventually killed by the cartel, but her legacy lives on. Her son son, Luis, took over the group and continued the fight for justice. He vowed to carry on his mother's legacy and ensure that no other family would suffer the same fate. Her unwavering determination and courage made her a hero in her hometown. A bronze plaque now stands in the central square, honoring her legacy and reminding everyone of the power of a mother's love and the strength of the human spirit. Miriam Rodriguez, a woman who dedicated her life to finding her daughter's killers, will forever be remembered as a symbol of courage and resilience. The Gallos it was a sunny day in July 2000 when Eduardo Gallo's world was shattered. His beloved daughter, Paola, was kidnapped from their weekend home in Tepoztlan, Mexico. The criminals demanded a ransom of $18,500, over 3 million Mexican pesos, and Eduardo, desperate to save his daughter, did everything he could to meet their demands. But tragedy struck when Paola's lifeless body was discovered, leaving Eduardo consumed by grief and a burning desire for justice. She was found in an abandoned car near the drop-off point for the the ransom near three other dead men. The police started investigating the case immediately, but weren't making much progress. Frustrated by the lack of progress in the official investigation, Eduardo took an unorthodox approach to carry out his revenge. He made a life-altering decision, shutting down his successful consulting firm to embark on a relentless pursuit of the truth. He immersed himself in the criminal underworld, gathering information and making connections with individuals who could help him track down the perpetrators. Eduardo became a vigilante, operating outside the boundaries of the law to bring his own form of justice. With each step closer to the truth, Eduardo's resolve grew stronger. He meticulously planned his revenge, gathering evidence and building a case against the individuals responsible for his daughter's death. Eduardo's actions were driven by a mix of grief, anger, and a burning desire to protect other families from experiencing the same pain. When the time came, Eduardo executed his plan with precision and determination. He confronted the killers, ensuring that they faced the consequences of their actions. With the help of the police, 
Eduardo orchestrated a stakeout that led to the arrest of Francisco Zamora Arellano, the man responsible for Paola's death. In a shocking turn of events, Arellano confessed to the crime, bringing closure to Eduardo and his family. However, the consequences of Eduardo's revenge were far-reaching. His actions had a profound impact on his own life and the lives of those around him. The line between justice and vengeance blurred, and Eduardo found himself grappling with the moral implications of his choices. The toll it took on his mental and emotional well-being was immense, but he remained steadfast in his belief that he had done what was necessary to honor his daughter's memory. The Gallo family's story is a testament to the lengths a parent will go to seek justice for their child. It serves as a stark reminder of the flaws in the justice system and the frustrations that can drive individuals to take matters into their own hands. Join us as we uncover the stories of eight other families who, like the Gallos, took revenge on their children's killers, the Backmires. In this gripping story, we delve into the life of Marianne Backmire, a woman driven to the edge by unimaginable tragedy. Marianne's world was shattered when her seven-year-old daughter, Anna, fell victim to a heinous crime. Faced with the monster responsible for her child's death, Marianne took matters into her own hands, unleashing a hail of bullets in a courtroom. But her actions would land her in the very same seat, on trial for the murder of her daughter's killer. The Backmire family's idyllic life was shattered when their daughter, Anna, went missing. The heart-wrenching discovery of her rape and murder by Klaus Grabowski sent shockwaves through their close-knit community. The grief-stricken mother was determined to find justice for her daughter and ensure that Grabowski paid for his heinous crimes. Marianne Backmeyer, Anna's mother, embarked on a tireless quest to track down her daughter's killer. She refused to let her grief consume her, channeling her pain into a relentless pursuit of justice. Marianne's determination fueled her revenge mission. She tirelessly investigated Grabowski's background, delving into his past and uncovering a trail of violence and abuse. Armed with this knowledge, Marianne devised a plan to confront Grabowski and ensure that he faced the consequences of his actions. Marianne's revenge took a dramatic turn when she attended Grabowski's trial. In a shocking act of defiance, she pulled out a gun and shot him in the courtroom filled with people. The act sent shockwaves through the legal system and captivated the nation. Marianne's actions were a desperate attempt to take matters into her own hands and deliver the justice she felt was lacking. The consequences of Marianne's revenge were profound. Her trial became a media spectacle, with public public opinion divided on whether Marianne's actions were justified or crossed the line into vigilantism. She faced criminal charges for her actions and was held accountable for the murder of Klaus Grabowski. Marianne was sentenced to six years imprisonment after being convicted of manslaughter and unlawful possession of a firearm. The impact of Marianne's revenge extended beyond the courtroom. It had a lasting effect on her emotional well-being and strained her relationships with her loved ones. Marianne became a symbol of a grieving mother pushed to the edge. She was released on probation after serving three out of her six-year sentence. After her release, Bachmeier moved abroad but eventually returned to her home country, Germany. She was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer just before she left the country. In 1996, she died of cancer and was buried next to her beloved daughter, Anna. The Terries the Terry family's world was turned upside down when Van Terry received the devastating news that his daughter, Sherelda Terry, had become a victim of the notorious Ohio serial killer, Michael Madison. The pain and grief that engulfed his heart were unimaginable, but on that fateful day in court, he found the strength to confront the man responsible for his daughter's untimely death. As the courtroom filled with anticipation, Van Terry approached the podium to address the judge. His voice trembled with a mix of anger, sorrow, and determination. He spoke directly from his heart, expressing the profound impact of his daughter's loss on their family. Van Terry's words were filled with raw emotion as he confronted the man who had taken his beloved child away from him. The courtroom fell silent after he spoke, the weight of his words hanging in the air. But Van Terry's address was far from over. He paused, turning his gaze towards the man who sat behind the defense table, Michael Madison. In that moment, a surge of emotions overwhelmed Van Terry. The grief, the anger, the desire for justice all converged into a single, powerful impulse. I will not let the bad tear while the short tear. Right now, I guess we're supposed to, in our hearts, forgive this clown who's touched our families, taken my child.
without warning, Van Terry broke free from the restraints of grief and dashed towards the convicted killer. He leaped over the table, propelled by an overwhelming need to confront the man who had forever altered his family's life. The courtroom erupted into chaos as deputies and onlookers scrambled to react. Amidst the commotion, shouts of no echoed through the gallery while someone else screamed, Terry! The intensity of the moment was palpable as the clash between Van Terry and Michael Madison unfolded before the stunned eyes of those present. Law enforcement officers swiftly intervened, wrestling Van Terry to the ground. Madison and others in the courtroom scrambled to find safety, their faces etched with shock and disbelief. The scene was one of pandemonium, a collision of emotions and the raw reality of a grieving father's pain. Eventually, Van Terry was dragged from the courtroom, his struggle against the restraints a symbol of the pain and anguish that consumed him. Madison, seemingly unharmed, remained in his seat, a chilling reminder of the heinous crimes he had committed. Following the chaotic outburst, the courtroom regained its composure and the sentencing hearing continued. Cuyahoga County Common Pleas, Judge Nancy McDonnell, undeterred by the disruption, went on with the proceedings. Ultimately, she accepted the jury's recommendation and sentenced Michael Madison to death for the 2013 killings. The horrific nature of Madison's crimes, coupled with the evidence presented during the trial, outweighed any attempts to spare him from the ultimate punishment. The families of the victims, including Van Terry, found solace in the fact that justice had been served. The Bamberskis. My Daughter's Killer is a poignant true crime documentary about the sudden death of a young girl whose father refused to accept that his daughter died under normal circumstances. This tale of justice and revenge will take you on a journey through decades of heartbreak, determination, and ultimately, the pursuit of justice. In the quiet town of Lindau, Germany, the Bamberski family led a seemingly idyllic life. Andre Bamberski, a loving father, and his wife Danny doted on their beautiful daughter, Kalinka. But little did they know that their lives were about to be shattered by a chance encounter with a man who would become their worst nightmare. It was the summer of 1982 when the Bamberski family crossed paths with Dieter Krombach, a German doctor who had recently moved to the area. Krombach, with his charming demeanor and professional reputation, quickly gained the trust of the community. On a warm July evening, the Bamberski family invited Krombach to their home for a casual gathering. Unbeknownst to them, this fateful decision would forever change their lives. As the evening progressed, Kalinka, a vibrant and innocent 14-year-old found herself alone with Krombach. What transpired in those moments would haunt the Bamberski family for years to come. The truth emerged in the aftermath of that night. Kalinka had been sexually assaulted and tragically lost her life. The Bamberski family was left devastated, grappling with grief and the unimaginable pain of losing their beloved daughter. Her father, Andre Bamberski, consumed by grief, embarked on a relentless quest to uncover the truth behind his daughter's death. He refused to accept the initial investigation's conclusion that Kalinka's death was accidental. Andre gathered evidence, piecing together a puzzle that pointed to Krombach's involvement in his daughter's demise, but justice would prove elusive, as legal complications and jurisdictional challenges hindered his efforts. Undeterred, Andre Bamberski vowed to never give up. He fought tirelessly, navigating the complexities of the legal system, determined to bring Krombach to justice and ensure that his daughter's memory would not be forgotten. After 25 years of fighting, Krombach was held accountable for his crimes. The the French court's verdict brought a sense of closure to the Bamberski family, a glimmer of justice in the face of unimaginable tragedy. The story raises important questions about the flaws in our legal systems, the limitations of international cooperation, and the lengths individuals may go to when failed by the very institutions meant to protect them. The Bamberski family's story serves as a reminder that justice is not always easily obtained. It requires resilience, determination, and sometimes extraordinary measures. It showcases the power of a father's love for his child, even in death. The Shazims Maud. Shazim was a beloved member of the community, known for his kindness and ambition. He had dreams of making a difference in the world, but fate had a different plan in store for him. Unbeknownst to Shazim, a notorious criminal named Arif, Hussein had set his sights on him. Arif Hussein was no stranger to the dark side of life, with a long list of offenses and a terrible reputation. Arif Hussein saw Shazim as an obstacle, a threat to his illicit activities. He devised a sinister plan to eliminate Shazim, ensuring that he would never stand in his way again. Again, and so on that fateful night, 
as Shazim walked home, unaware of the danger lurking in the shadows. Tragedy struck. Arif Hussein, fueled by his twisted motives, attacked Shazim with a cold and calculated brutality. The news of Shazim's murder was devastating, leaving his family and friends devastated. The loss of such a promising young life was a blow that would forever change their lives. In the wake of his son's tragic murder, Mr. Ahmed, Maud's father, hatched a plan that would send shockwaves through the city of Barili. Mr. Ahmed knew that the wheels of justice could be slow and unpredictable. He couldn't bear the thought of his son's killer roaming free, so he made a shocking decision. He would ensure the release of Arif Hussein on bail, but not for the reasons one might expect. Mr. Ahmed used every resource at his disposal, leveraging his connections and influence to orchestrate Arif Hussein's release. It was a move that left everyone bewildered and questioning his motives. As the courtroom granted Arif Hussein bail, the public watched in disbelief. They couldn't comprehend why a grieving father would go to such lengths to set his son's killer free. Behind closed doors, Mr. Ahmed revealed his true intentions to a select few. He had meticulously planned every step of his revenge, gathering evidence, witnesses, and support from the community. One fateful evening, Mr. Ahmed invited Arif Hussein to a secluded location on the outside skirts of Bareilly. The tension in the air was palpable as the two men faced each other, their eyes filled with anger and grief. Mr. Ahmed confronted Arif Hussein with undeniable evidence of his son's murder, leaving him with no room for denial or escape. It was a moment of reckoning, a moment where justice would finally be served. In a shocking turn of events, Mr. Ahmed pulled out a gun and aimed it at Arif Hussein. The world seemed to stand still as the sound of the gunshot echoed through the night. Arif Hussein fell to the ground. The news of Mr. Ahmed's act of revenge spread like wildfire, leaving the city of Bareilly in a state of shock. People were divided in their opinions, some applauding his courage and determination while others condemned his actions. In the aftermath of the incident, Mr. Ahmed was arrested and faced trial for his actions. The Stokes family Tyshawn Lee, an innocent and vibrant nine-year-old, was enjoying a sunny day at the park near his grandmother's house. He was sitting on a swing, laughing and enjoying the carefree moments of childhood. But then, a man named Durite Boone Doty approached Tyshawn. Doty, a stranger to the young boy, dribbled his basketball and offered to buy him a juice box. Tyshawn, trusting and unaware of the danger that awaited him, followed Doty into an alley. Unfortunately, this alley would become the setting for a brutal and senseless act of violence. Doty, fueled by a sinister motive, shot the innocent child multiple times in the head at close range. The echoes of the gunshots reverberated through the alley. The news of Tishan's tragic death quickly reached his family. The Reverend Michael Fleger, a Roman Catholic priest who presided over the boy's funeral mass, described the scene as one of the most evil acts he had ever witnessed. A young boy lying lifeless in an alley next to a garbage can, his basketball just a few feet away. T. Sean's murder garnered national media attention, shining a spotlight on the ongoing gang warfare that plagued the streets of Chicago. Investigators soon discovered that Ty Sean had been executed by gang members as a message to his father, Pierre Stokes, who was allegedly a member of a rival gang. The motive behind Tyshawn's murder was rooted in a cycle of violence that had consumed the city for years. Stokes, devastated by the loss of his son, would soon find himself seeking revenge. Months after Tyshawn's death, Stokes encountered Doty's girlfriend and her two adult nephews. Fueled by grief and anger, Stokes looked straight at her, threatened her, and fired six shots. It was an act of vigilante justice, a desperate attempt to avenge his son's murder. But as the saying goes, vigilante justice is not justice. Assistant State's attorney Melanie Matias made it clear during Stokes's trial that street justice is not the answer. After hours of deliberation, a Cook County jury found Pierre Stokes guilty of attempted murder, aggravated battery with a firearm, and a gun charge in connection to the triple shooting. Now, he faces the harsh reality of a potential life sentence. The impact of Pierre's revenge on his own life was profound. He was ultimately sentenced to 30 years in jail for his actions, paying the price for taking the law into his own hands. The public opinion surrounding his case was divided with some seeing him as a hero and others viewing him as a vigilante. As we reflect on this tragic tale, let us remember the innocent lives lost and the families torn apart due to gang violence in Chicago. The Lopez Family Louis Lopez, a 52-year-old father, had his world shattered when tragedy struck his family. In October, his beloved daughter, Danielle Lopez, lost her life in a devastating accident that would set off a chain of events no one could have predicted. Danielle, just 16 years old, was a vibrant and promising young girl. She had dreams of a bright future, filled with laughter, love, and endless possibilities. It was a fateful day in 680 in San Jose when Danielle's life was tragically ended. After an argument with her 18 
18-year-old boyfriend, she stepped out of the car they were in. Little did she know that this decision would lead to a series of events that would forever change the lives of those involved. As Danielle walked along the busy highway, she was struck by not one, not two, but four cars. The details of that horrific moment are etched into the minds of those who witnessed it, forever haunting their memories. Since that tragic day, Louis Lopez, her father, was completely consumed by grief, unable to find solace or closure. The loss of his daughter has left a void in his heart that nothing can fill. Louis's grief would lead him down a path of darkness, seeking justice for his daughter's untimely death. Even if Danielle's death was ruled an accident, Louis wasn't satisfied. He was determined to hold someone responsible for the death of his child. In a shocking turn of events, Louis shot and killed Ronaldo Cantu, the father of Danielle's boyfriend. Cantu, father of three and loving husband, died at the scene. Louis was subsequently charged with murder. Community members frowned upon the drastic actions Louis took, calling him unreasonable and blaming him for killing Cantu in cold blood. The community, once united in grief over the death of Danielle, now finds itself torn apart by this tragedy. The loss of two lives has left scars that may never fully heal. On one hand, there is the death of a vibrant young girl. On the other hand, there is the brutal killing of a father of three. Danielle Lopez, a bright and promising young girl, should be remembered for the joy she brought into the world, not the pain and suffering that followed her death. Her memory lives on in the hearts of those who loved her, forever cherished and never forgotten. Cantu's legacy will also live on through his grieving wife and children. The Nicholsons in a quiet town plagued by tragedy, the life of Danny L. Nicholson II became a nightmare. It all began with the heart-wrenching loss of his 17-year-old son, Kassir Gambil. In December 2020, Kassir was tragically shot and killed, leaving his family heartbroken and consumed by grief. But little did anyone know that this unexpected loss would ignite a dangerous path of revenge. The pain of losing a child is indescribable, and for Danny Nicholson, it was unbearable. As he grappled with his grief, he faced taunting and torment from those who enjoyed his suffering. The constant reminders of his son's death broke something inside him, pushing him to the edge of sanity, and in his shattered state, he made a fateful decision that would change everything. Seeking justice for his son, Danny Nicholson embarked on a path of revenge, targeting those he believed were responsible for Cassia's untimely demise. The gang known as the Five, or the Five Ive, became the focus of Nicholson's rage. He believed they were connected to his son's death, and he was determined to make them pay. What started as a grieving father's quest for justice would soon spiral into a series of shocking revenge killings that would rock the community to its core. In March 2021, Nicholson killed two members of the gang, Morris Packley and Jason D. Wells, after shooting up Erie Bar. Three other people were injured during the shooting. This was after he had gone on a shooting spree, rampaging the entire community without minding the consequences. Police successfully apprehended Nicholson after the bar shooting incident, and his revenge mission finally came to an end. The pain and loss experienced by the families of Morris Packley and Jason D. Wells are immeasurable, leaving a void that can never be filled. Nicholson was subsequently charged with two counts of third-degree murder and other charges. During his trial, the courtroom was filled with raw emotions as loved ones spoke, some pleading for leniency while others demanded justice. Erie County Judge Daniel Brabender, recognizing the gravity of the crimes, handed down a sentence of 45 to 90 years in state prison. The community can now find solace in knowing that Nicholson will be behind bars ensuring their safety. While many felt empathy for the grieving father, most people believed that Nicholson went too far in his quest for vengeance. The scars left by this shocking incident would remain forever. The Torres Felix the Torres family's tragic story is intertwined with the dangerous world of drug cartels and the devastating impact it had on their lives. Their personal connection to a Mexican cartel that killed their son, Anastasio, led to a relentless quest for revenge that spanned years and affected hundreds of people. Manuel Torres Felix, aka LM1, was known for his meticulous tactics and control over the Sinaloa cartel. After his elder brother got arrested, he handled his role as a drug lord perfectly, but changed from cartel leader leader to mass murderer after the tragic death of his son. On April 18, 2008, in Julia Khan, Sinaloa, Mexico, tragedy struck when assassins from a Mexican cartel ambushed and brutally killed a young man named Anastasio Torres Acosta. Anastasio was not just any ordinary young man, he was the son of the infamous Sinaloa cartel leader, LM1. With the devastating loss of his son, LM1's world was plunged into darkness. He knew his son was killed as a message to him and was fully prepared to answer 
answer that message. The death of his son transformed him into a vengeful demon, driven by an insatiable thirst for blood. No one was safe from his wrath as he hunted down everyone in the rival cartel. The streets trembled with fear as LM1 unleashed his fury upon those who dared to cross his path. He tracked down and killed the rival cartel leader who ordered the hit on his son. Retaliation started and no one was safe across both organizations. Personally, LM1 reportedly killed over 30 people, including law enforcement agents. He also ordered his guys to kill hundreds more. The consequences of LM1's actions were devastating. Hundreds of lives were lost in a father's quest for revenge. The cycle of violence and bloodshed seemed never-ending, leaving a trail of destruction in its wake. LM1's actions were driven by a mix of love for his son and a need to dismantle the cartel responsible for his murder. In October 2012, he was killed during a standoff with the authorities in Oso Viejo in Culiacán, Sinaloa. The military raided his houses and hideouts, seizing all his guns, booms, and ammunition. The bloodbath finally came to an end. His legacy and the Sinaloa cartel continues to shape the landscape of Mexican. Organized crime. The power struggles, alliances, and relentless pursuit of dominance still play out to this day. The stories of these ten families serve as a reminder that justice is not always easily obtained. It requires resilience, determination, and sometimes extraordinary measures. It is a testament to the power of a parent's love for their child and the lengths they will go to seek justice or revenge. Click on the next video for more fascinating true crime stories.